Tonight on Primetime Politics, another day, another rate hike. The Bank of Canada raises its key rate for the seventh time this year, but will it be the last, or should Canadians expect another bump in the new year? Also... Obviously moving forward on some very big partnerships with Indigenous communities. The Prime Minister commits hundreds of millions of dollars to preserve and foster biodiversity. We're taking control of our own destiny again. And he is turning to Indigenous leadership to make it happen. Plus... The LGBTQ community uh, that are still repressed in Qatar. For going the World Cup in Qatar to stand for 2S LGBTQ rights. We'll speak with the Minister for Sport, Pascal Senange. This is Primetime Politics. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Serapio. Well, for those who have variable rate mortgages or lines of credit, the bad news is the Bank of Canada raised its key rate once again today, up 50 basis points and now sitting at 4.25%. Now, that is the highest it has been in 14 years. But if there is any good news, the bank also seems to be softening on any future hike to the rate, saying it will now consider another increase in the new year rather than what it said before when it said a hike would be needed. Now, the Bank of Canada's rate hike was brought up during question period today. Take a look. Well, Canadians were hit with another interest rate uppercut today uh, after inflationary deficits by this Liberal government are driving up inflation and interest rates. The governor of the Bank of Canada has even said these deficits are driving the higher costs. One mother told the CBC that she signed in to a 1.9% mortgage variable rate because she believed the government that rates would be low for long. And now she says, I punched myself on, the, uh, on that decision. Why did I listen to these people? Mr. Speaker, how is this mother going to pay the extra $1,000 a month in mortgage payments that they're putting on her back? Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd be careful if I were the member opposite asking people who's listening to whose advice when his idea to hedge on inflation was to go buy crypto. Shame on that advice. Irresponsible. Not appropriate. Mr. Speaker, we are going to eliminate interest on student loans and apprentice loans. We're going to make it more affordable to buy a house. We're going to get workers the money they need faster, Mr. Speaker. In one hour, the Conservative chorus can sing with us and support Canadians, or they can do what they've always done and voted against. With their thoughts on today's announcement and what it means for the way forward, we're now joined by Armin Yalnizian and Kevin Page. Armin is an economist and the Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers. Kevin is the CEO of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy. Hello to the two of you. Good afternoon. Uh, Kevin, hi there. Uh, Kevin, I'm going to actually get you to start us out because these interest rate hikes, they they are an attempt to get inflation down, but it already is down from its August high. We've also seen uh, this cooling trend over the last three months. So why the need to bump the bank rate up another 50 basis points? So, Michael, it's a fair question. Um, You know, the year over year inflation rate has fallen from a little over 8 percent to uh, just under 7%. I think the expectation is that in Canada and other countries that will continue to see these interest rates come down as the global economy slows. I think what frustrates uh, and bothers policymakers, the central bankers, is that you know what we call the core rate of inflation, the CPI rate of inflation when you exclude food and energy, is stubbornly sitting at a little over 5%, which is well above the 1% to 3% range. So they they see that as being a, a key interest rate that set, helps sets inflationary expectations. So they they felt that they still needed this additional 50 basis point increase that we saw today. Okay, the need for it. But, you know, Armin, as we know, monetary policy takes time to filter its way uh, through the economy. So in your opinion, was a big move like this necessary? Oh, in my opinion, as a citizen, I would say Of course, it wasn't necessary. It's unclear that these higher rates are doing anything to the costs that we are experiencing. But the real big story here is the credibility of central banks, not only in Canada, but around the world, being able to tame inflation. And they can't do it unless they actually cause economies to slow down and slow down quite dramatically. We've really only seen two episodes of this in the past, and it is being assumed that we can um, cool the economy without triggering a huge recession uh, by 
cranking up rates and slowing down demand and giving supply a chance to catch up. It's unclear to me that that is going to be the solution for this round of inflation in the early 20th century, 21st century. But that's that's the story. That's the theory. OK, that's the theory. So why isn't is it not clear to you that that theory might actually work out? Because in the past, it has been about excess demand because there's been a, a lot of purchasing power moving forward. And now it is about just supply not showing up. We're trying to cool demand to give enough time for supply to show up. But um, raising interest rates isn't going to change Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And raising interest rates may or may not cause OPEC to release more gas onto global markets. These are the big things that are influencing inflation rates right now for food, for fuel, and for housing. The one thing that directly the central bank controls is housing prices. And while prices are falling, carrying costs are rising, and more people are staying in the rental market, which is crowding an, a market that is already doesn't have enough affordable housing. So you're seeing prices starting to rise there. So it's it's not clear to me that we are going to tame inflation this way. Well, Kevin, what's your response to that? Because, you know, as I listen to Armin, I'm also thinking about the dangers of raising the interest rate too high. Yeah, Michael, I think, um, like to Armin's point, I think a lot of this inflation is supply related, not all of it. I think we have I think the governor of the Bank of Canada feels that we have um, excess demand pressure relative to restricted supply. But I, I agree with Armin. I think in, if we look at some labor market indicators, the employment rate, the participation rate, they still haven't recovered uh, from the pre-COVID levels. If we look at output um, growth, I mean, output growth since February 2020 has been about 2.7 percent. That's a two and a half year period. In the year prior to the start of COVID, February 2020, we saw upward growth, real upward growth at two, at 2.7 percent. So we grew, you know, we grew just as much in one year as we have in, in subsequently in the two and a half years. So I think, but I think, inflation is coming down. It's coming down in Canada. It's coming down in the U.S. It's coming down in Europe. I think uh, there, there's uh, a, a growth slowdown that is taking place. It's in the leading indicators now. We're going to start. We're going to see it um, in retail, and we're seeing it in housing. Um, you know, we're seeing in asset markets. And um, so I, I think we are going to see a pretty significant drop in inflation. But unfortunately, that's going to come with a huge, uh, huge cost to, to workers and to output. Well, I was I was going to ask about that. And maybe I mean, you can pick up on that point, because when you look at the inflationary pressures, one of the indicators is the fact that uh, unemployment is so low. So who needs to be worried? Who needs to be concerned uh, with these interest rates if part of the solution would mean people losing their jobs. Well, that's the definition of cooling the economy, is that fewer people are working the same hours and some people actually lose their jobs. I mean, look, we're talking about seven rate hikes and there were the businesses that barely hung on after two and a half years of pandemic, some businesses are folding. So we will see more layoffs. Uh, but because there are labor shortages everywhere, people may be able to pick up more jobs. That I'm really concerned that the unemployment rate of 5%-ish is being viewed as unsustainable. And frankly, that when I was taking economics, that was kind of the goal of economics is to have full employment. So I think it's in the eye of the beholder as to whether it's sustainable or not. But I just want to go back to another point about low unemployment is partly, it's not only, but is partly a function of demographics. We are, along with every other country that had a baby boom after the Second World War, seeing more exits from the labor market than entrance to it. And we're all competing for immigrants to deal with labor shortages in high skill, low skill, high wage, low wage jobs. Like there's tightness everywhere. And the idea that we can bring um, target inflation to 2% when underlying this phenomenon is a phenomenon we've never seen before is a demographically induced labor shortage that is widespread and happening in multiple countries at the same time. I'm not sure you can get away by, with saying, oh, this is a terrible thing and people shouldn't ask for wage growth when any other part of the market that had a supply shortage would see a price rise. So I just think we're, we're playing with concept, economic concepts that don't necessarily fit this moment. Mm -hmm. Don't fit this moment. So, so I'm wondering then, uh, as we pick up on that point, Armin, uh, do you take any kind of comfort with the discussion that this might be uh, at this current rate at 4.25% where the Bank of Canada holds for now uh, until it sees what unfolds in the first uh, and second quarters of the new year? 
I would think that that's exactly should be the plan anyway, uh, though there is a lot more bearish uh, players out there saying that we actually need to wrestle this inflation down lower. Don't forget, inflation is nobody's friend. Nobody wants inflation. Everybody wants price stability. So how do we get it? And maybe is is monetary policy the primary tool for achieving it? Or are other things going to be necessary to actually wrestle some prices back down to earth after they skyrocket? rocketed prices go up very quickly but it's very hard to get them to come back down mm -hmm, mm -hmm. kevin what do you think it is 4.25 percent what we're going to be looking at for the first and second quarters of the new year or is there a risk of another rate hike um well i, I think like i think 4.25 percent policy rate will probably be the interest rate over you know the next three to six months you know if it's you know the bank's assumption is that the economy will effectively flatline we could be in a technical recession early next year i think it'd be very difficult uh for the bank of canada to raise interest rates in an environment where you know unemployment is going up and output is declining so then and the next rate hike in late january will take place or the next rate announcement rather will take place in late january the next budget federal budget will take place in the winter time of 2023 and it will also be in an environment of a recession so difficult times ahead and i think pretty much most of that is baked in the cake because as Armin alluded to you know in 10 months we've seen a four percentage point increase in policy rates which has meant four percent point increases in household and business rates well uh, we are certainly watching it very closely we'll be getting more of an explanation of the bank can as this week goes on but for now uh, Armin, kevin thank you for that appreciate the time today thank you for having Good us to be with you At COP15 in Montreal today, the Prime Minister made a significant announcement. Justin Trudeau pledging upwards of $800 million to four Indigenous-led conservation efforts to protect nature and biodiversity in this country. Now, one partnership includes the Nonwakalis Council in British Columbia, which is working to preserve and manage what is known as the Great Bear Sea. The waters that extend from Campbell River on Vancouver Island up the BC coast to the Alaska border and the surrounding rainforest. The kind of stewardship, the Prime Minister says, is important for long-term preservation of biodiversity in Canada. We are uh, obviously moving forward on some very big partnerships with Indigenous communities uh, in the lead to be able to protect uh, large parts of Canada. Uh, but there's work to do in every corner of the country. Protecting 30% of Canada's lands and waters can only happen with full partnership with Indigenous people. We know that. And we're acting that on that on good faith with Indigenous leadership. With their collaboration, we can make the past a lesson, the present an example, and the future the new standard. We are now joined by Dallas Smith. He is the president of the Nanwakalis Council, which is comprised of six member nations in British Columbia. Dallas Smith, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I want to begin uh, with your thoughts uh, on what you heard today, because I wonder what it means to you to hear the acknowledgement from the Prime Minister, from the Environment Minister, that biodiversity can only be uh, preserved with the participation of Indigenous leadership. Today's announcement showed me that we've been on the right path with the work we've done in the Great Bear Rainforest over the last 20 years. We've really taken a conflict and we've taken our community's values and we've brought them forward. And we're happy to see the Prime Minister acknowledge that today. And we look forward to continue working with all the user groups within our territories to find that more balanced, sustainable future that, that we need. Mm -hmm. Now, Ottawa is pledging upwards of $800 million over seven years. You know, for people that are walking into this right now, how do you see that money, uh, this partnership working? Because we are talking about a big dollar figure, but also a huge responsibility. Definitely. There's a lot of accountability that comes into governance and management of things. And, you know, so for the general public, that really sounds like a huge, astounding figure. And it is. It's, it's a real commitment. But we got to understand that this is going to be shared between, you know, 40 some odd different communities that were part of the announcement today. And for specifically us in the Great Bear Sea, um, we have 17 different communities that are going to be working in perpetuity thanks to this uh, announcement today. Uh, working in perpetuity, as you say, but in terms of particulars, where does that money go towards? What type of activities do you hope to invest that money in? We really hope to continue to invest in a conservation economy. 
through the terrestrial part of the Great Bear Rainforest, we found ourselves in a position where we're trying to work to other people's needs. And over that time, we've established what our communities need. And we figured out that we need stewardship programs, both out there to protect our territories, but also to watch over the sustainable development of areas that we agree to in our territory. So we really see the core of this funding going towards future stewardship initiatives that are both going to enable further protection and make sure that development is going to be more sustainable. And when we, we talk about that, of course, in British Columbia, uh, lumber is, is a big industry. Is it uh, lumber that you're thinking of in particular, the ancient rainforest? Uh, what in particular are you hoping that the money will help preserve uh, when it comes to your territory? Well, I think we hope it preserves our way of life and finding that balance. It's so important not to get stuck on one commodity versus another. We're very interested in the blue economy, but we don't want it to be based solely on extraction. So we think that these dollars are going to really help us build the capacity to look further at other opportunities around, say, shellfish harvesting or different um, ways of growing sustainable seafood production, as well as making sure that we can develop some workable tourism opportunities that, you know, don't really have that impact in, in, in our territories. Mm-hmm. Now, with this announcement and the acknowledgement that that we heard again from both the Prime Minister and the Environment Minister, that these states are being made in front of a global audience right now because of COP15 in Montreal. So beyond the impact in your own territory, I'm wondering about the international impact you hope this statement has, because as I don't have to tell you, Indigenous stewardship, land rights, those are issues worldwide. Definitely. Over the years of working through the terrestrial protection of our territories, we've built relationships with people in the Himalayans, with, in Chile, in Papua New Guinea, and other indigen- other places where Indigenous people are trying to you know, gain that self-determination. And we really hope that we can build a path that others can follow to help them realize the goals and dreams when it comes to the conservation economy development within their traditional territories. Mm-hmm. And as for this country, uh, because... Uh, as again, I don't want to tell you that we are right now just beginning this process of reconciliation in Canada. What impact do you hope this agreement will have on future uh, issues when it comes to Indigenous leadership and Indigenous issues in this country? Well, I think it takes the pressure off of having to rely solely on the development of resources. We're able to now take a better look at what's going on in our territories, what needs to continue, but what has to be done with lighter touch, and what other opportunities can we introduce into Indigenous communities. We've got to remember that a lot of these communities are remote, and so job creation and economic development also has to go hand in hand with conservation opportunities, and we think we're getting that much closer to finding that path in the Great Bear Rainforest with the Great Bear Sea as well now. Dallas Smith, really appreciate the time today. Thank you for that. Thanks for having me. The World Cup in Qatar is now down to the round of eight, Canada being eliminated last weekend. And while the Minister for International Development, Harjit Sajjan, was in the Arab Kingdom cheering on the red and the white, this country's sports minister was cheering on Team Canada right here on Canadian soil. It was a decision Pascal Saint-Ange made for very specific reasons. I spoke to her about them earlier this week. Well, we're now joined by the Minister for Sport, Pascal saint Minister, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So I want to begin here uh, with the World Cup taking place in Qatar. Of course, a historic moment for Canada after such a long absence. But you actually made the decision not to attend. And reports uh, uh, attribute that to your decision to stand in solidarity with the 2S LGBTQ community as well as uh, foreign laborers. Talk to us about that decision. Well, you know, I used to be a union leader and everyone knows that I'm gay also. Um, so, you know, even though the, the World Cup is a sport event, uh, it's also for government to send representatives, it's also for di- diplomatic reasons. Um, so it was the right call to send Minister Sajan, who's responsible for international development, who already has relationships with his counterparts in, the, in Qatar, but also all over the world. And it was the right moment to have those conversations about Uh, labor rights, about the LGBTQ uh, community as well, and their rights. Um, So uh, that's uh, that's the call that our government made. 
Well, as you say, uh, you're gay. You're the first uh, out lesbian serving in federal cabinet. Was was Qatar even a possibility for you, or did you know from the start you would not be going? Well, the important thing for me was to have the right person to have those conversations in advance, human rights uh, in Qatar, but also all over the world. And it's by having those conversations and good relationships with our counterparts that we can have those open and transparent discussions. Uh, and Minister Sajan has worked uh, on the uh, international portfolio for a while. He already has those con conversations. So uh, it was the right call. And for me, it was about cheering for our team right here in Canada with the rest of uh, my colleagues. You know, we watched a game uh, uh, when we had time uh, during uh, in the lobby in the House of <laughs> Commons. So, uh, yeah, so... You know, uh, it's a sporting event, but for governments to send representatives, it's more about the diplomatic relationships and, and conversations. Were you at all worried that perhaps they wouldn't have been as open to listen to criticism or, or commentary for, from an openly gay woman? I think that those conversations are better when you already have a relationship with the people. And uh, Minister Sajan has worked for years uh, building those relationships and, and bringing Canadian values uh, in each of those visits, um, and and uh, and you know, and, and build that trust and that uh, openness. So, uh, and and that's the context that needs to happen uh, when you want to challenge, um, you know, other uh, other countries' uh, values and and policies. Mm -hmm. And you know, you talked about that relationship, and I think it's important to acknowledge the fact that Qatar did help out Canada in evacuating people with ties to this country uh, from Afghanistan when, when Kabul fell. So given that relationship, and despite all the criticism, do you think the marker has been moved at all when it comes to labor rights, when it comes to, to spirit LGBTQ rights? Do you think that marker has been changed by Canada's involvement and Minister Sajjan's uh, attendance? Absolutely. Uh, there has been pro progress in, uh, in Qatar about the labor rights. It's not perfect. There's still work to do. Same uh, for the LGBTQ community uh, that are still repressed in Qatar. Um, but, uh, you know, by building this kind of relationship with other countries, that's how we can uh, move forward, you know, our democratic values and, and uh, social values as well. So, um, Nothing is black and white and uh, not talking to anyone and isolating like some people think that we should have done is not necessarily how we can improve people's lives in other countries that are repressed and uh, are um, under a lot of pressure uh, in regards to labor, uh, labor rights as well. The Minister for Sport, Pascal Saint-Ange. Now, our conversation did continue, and we talked about the revelations that were made this past summer about Hockey Canada and the issues that led to members of that organization's board to resign. We will play that part of the interview for you tomorrow, but right now, take a look at this quick preview. The local police have reopened their own investigations, and that's the right place to turn to when, uh, when situations of uh, sexual uh, violence happens. But with the sports system, we need to have uh, investigations about how those cases are managed, have the management taken the right steps to prevent these things from happening, and when they do, have they done the right thing by making sure that those that perpetrate criminal offense are responsible and are accountable for their own action. And that was the problem at Hockey Canada. One more note as we near the end of our program tonight, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, François-Philippe Champagne, ended the day in Ottawa by announcing changes to the Investment Canada Act. Billed as the most significant changes in a decade, they are meant to address security concerns, in part by giving the minister more power to trigger reviews of foreign investment. These amendments include requirements for investors in certain business sectors to file with my department prior to the implementation of their investment, authorities for the minister to extend the national security review process of investments, authorities for the minister to impose conditions during a national security review, authorities for the minister to accept undertakings to mitigate national security risks, improved information sharing with our international counterparts, 
new rules for the protection of sensitive information during the course of a potential judicial review, and finally, stronger penalties to be applied when an investor does not respect the rules in place. These proposed changes will ensure that foreign investments in Canada are not only to the net benefit of Canadians, but are not detrimental to our national security. I think what we're saying, geopolitics has changed. We need to change as well. Uh, we need to have processes in place. We need to be more vigilant. Uh, and, and I think what we're doing today is sending a signal as well. And that is what is really important because business wants to have predictability. And I think the recent uh, decisions we took to block, for example, certain transactions, the fact that we're saying now we're going to update our framework and that this framework will allow us to have more flexibility, more authorities, more tools in the toolbox to protect our national security and our national economic interests. I think it's well received. I can tell you our allies around the world are saying, good, uh, Canada is adopting best practices. And, and I would say the case you mentioned, um, I think it sends a signal also across town that we need to be more vigilant uh, with respect to these transactions and who's behind these transactions. Could you just give us a couple of examples of the sectors that you think are the most sensitive and why they are sensitive? Well, I would say certainly critical minerals. You know, at the time where you realize, uh, you know, when I was foreign affairs minister at the time, uh, we were looking with the G7, what are the key things you'll need for prosperity of the economy, for the economy of the 21st century? Or what is the critical path over the next 20, 30 years to fuel the economy of the future? And, and obviously vaccines came first because we've seen it. The second thing I would say is critical minerals and the third one would be semiconductors. Uh, so I think in that sector, when it comes to these uh, critical elements to fuel the economy of the 21st century, uh, we need to pay close attention. The other one I would say the underlying foundation for success in the 21st century is around quantum, it's around AI, it's around cybersecurity. So anything that will touch these critical uh, sensitive technology is something we will pay uh, additional attention, and certainly when it comes to pre-notification, uh, you can rest assured that it's going to include critical minerals, sensitive technologies, and anything about personal data, because we've seen more and more in the uh, digital economy, people who want access data of Canadians. Um, so uh, you can rest assured that I'll be a hawk in that to make sure that we protect uh, the information of Canadians and that any transaction uh, is in the interest of Canadians and our national security. And we will track reaction to the announcement in the days to come. For now, I'm Michael Serapio. For everyone here at CPAC, thank you for watching. We'll see you again tomorrow.